I'm Steve Townsend. What I do for a living is try and help farmers adopt conservation agriculture. And what I'm going to try and do this afternoon is put a little bit of theory into practice. What I'm going to talk about is having a planned adoption phase of the system and then I'm going to have a go at the thorny subject of choosing the right type of drill. Now I first like to start with this picture. It was given to me six years ago by a farmer in West Virginia. And yes, those are the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia in the background. Uh, he, uh, he entertained a group of us that were over there looking at Regen Ag and conservation agriculture. And he said, if you don't understand the significance of this picture, then you all might as well go back home to wherever you came from. So it wasn't a, a very nice welcome. But what he was trying to say is that we have to change our mindset. We need to get away from individual problems. We need to look at the problems of the system as a whole and the fact that they're all interconnected. And what I would like to do is start with a question. And that is, is agriculture, um, is it an art or skill supported by science? Or is it a science supported by art or skill? Anybody like to venture with an answer? Because then we know whether we're on the same page or not. Well, to me, it's definitely a skill or an art. It's a multifactorial thing, it's not a science. And I think for some time, science has tried to dominate us in agriculture too much. And I think groundswell is an epitome of farmers shaking off that um, uh, what, whatever words you might use and going towards their own thoughts, their own uh, initiation, uh, um, initiation and uh, ideas. So um, that, this statement here was written by or said by John Moore. He was the guy that started all the national parks in America and basically the, the uh, message with, the, with, with, with that cold web is that if you move one thing you move everything and that is summing up conservation agriculture, I think, quite nicely. Um, planning your adoption, why would we want to do that? There is a potential for a yield dip or risk if we try and in involve the whole farm in one go. Uh, we need to spread the risk because the weather patterns have definitely changed and therefore we don't want to have what we could call a yield dip. If we look at the yield dip, I uh, probably you've all seen this famous no tillers curve before where we start with the yield at the beginning and we get a bit of a dip through the first few years and then the yield or the promise from advisors like me and others is that your yields will become more sustainable or, or more efficient as we go on. And so what I would suggest to you is that yield dip is not compulsory. Uh, it's something that can be dealt with and I think the main reason for it is farmers are not giving enough uh, thought or initiative to the nutrition, which is namely nitrogen and phosphate. What you're doing is you're going to be changing the carbon to nitrogen ratios in the soil. You're going to be changing them completely differently from the way you've been managing them in the past. And therefore, your attention needs to be given to those factors to avoid that yield dip. There could be others, but in my experience, that's the ones that cause the most likely to get a, a yield dip. And of course, if someone advises you to rotationally cultivate, then you'll end up going backwards and forwards through that adoption phase, and then you won't know where you are. What I'm looking at there is probably uh, those who say you need to rotate the rotationally plow. Anyway, um, I think also, whilst we're adopting the system, we need to keep our fields level or maintain their levelness or get them level if need be. Uh, and we need to really probably start with a good crop of wheat after a break crop. Don't try and do the whole rotation in one go because I think that's where you'll end up exposing yourself to unfair risk. Uh, it takes more patience, sorry. That's the most important skill with all of this is actually between here, it's nothing to do with machinery which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute. It's all about your patience and your attention to detail that that patience can bring and give to the party. So, if we talk a little bit about drill selection, I know this is a thorny subject, but it's really, really important. I think it's the fulcrum of which the whole system revolves around. Therefore, we should put some attention to it. Um, there's a few statements up here. The perfect drill is yet to be designed, contrary to what all the drill salesmen around here will tell you. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it's yet to be designed. So, what do we do? Well, if we can work through a process of finding the best drill for you, or one that suits you, 85% of the time, then that will be the one for you. As the old adage goes, it's so important because if a crop is well sown, 
then it is literally half grown. And that is really important in reduced tillage uh, systems. Everybody asks me which drill works in the wet. Simple answer to that, that's very simple. None of them. We need to have the right conditions. So it comes down to having enough output. And I think there's too much focus on speed as being part of the output equation. The other side of the output equation is width. So uh, as I say there, if you're gonna have a drill, have a big one. One of the biggest drills or widest drills in the UK is an Amazon Condor. This one's 15 meters wide working in Gloucestershire. So you can imagine the output that that drill brings to the party in terms of getting uh, crops in the ground in, in good time. Well, drill selection, yes, you've basically got two types. Uh, you've either got a disc or a tine. And over time, I think the advice would be to have one of each, depending upon how you grow cover crops, what type of rotation you're, you're running. Uh, but uh, that's what you've got, a choice of two. What I've done here is I've listed a lot of the uh, attributes, some good and some not so good for each of the drills. And what I intend to do is just run through one or two of them uh, while we've got a moment here. So we concentrate on the discs. Um, yes, they do offer good penetration. That's all I want to say about that because you've got a lot of weight on a very narrow disc. Uh, and from that, they give you low soil disturbance, which is a good thing to have. I think uh, low soil movement is one of the three keys of conservation agriculture. So it's smack on the money there with, with delivering that. So the sort of thing we can see, this is from a, a double a disc opener, minimum soil disturbance, keeping the residue undisturbed on the surface, getting the crop away and emerging uh, nicely. That's what we're looking for. Um, low power requirement, of course, if you're not moving the soil, you don't need the power. Um, and also, a lot of disc drills will contour follow. Um, that's a little bit of a sales gimmick, in my opinion. Uh, any drill manufacturers here? Uh, unless you're um, uh, the wheel, the, the, the contour following wheel is right next to the coulter, like a John Deere or a, a horse drill, then you've not really got contour following. Uh, you've got uh, the, 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 the wheels are not close enough together to give really accurate contour following. The point about them all though is that when there's a hollow, the pressure can come off the disc and that can cause the disc to come out of the ground. So they're very good at going up, not so good at going into a hollow. <coughs> So that's another good reason for having your fields level strategically for other factors as well, but certainly for getting your drill to work, certainly will help that. Um, large cover crops. Obviously, we're all gonna be in the business of growing large cover crops. In disc drills have it by, uh, by a mile. You wouldn't wanna be trying to get a disc drill into that, a time drill into that, though I do know clients who have tried and succeeded actually in some cases, but a disc drill here going into wheat into a mustard cover crop after peas. And then in France, looking at winter barley going in after winter wheat into a vetch and sunflower cover crop. I just put that up just to show you uh, what, uh, what the French can do. Um, so then if we look at uh, the, some of the negatives of disc drills, the biggest one is crop residue hairpinning or riding out. What do I mean by that? As you see with a disc, you've either got one disc or two, and what they don't do all of the time, because we're in a temperate climate here, we're not in the middle of Kansas where a lot of these drills are designed, they don't cut through the residue and place the seed against soil. What they can do is push the residue into the ground, then you get seed to uh, residue contact, that is not a good thing or a good place to be. And also the, the residue can cause the disc to actually ride at the ground, like in this picture. Um, that's riding out through putting a disc drill into a lot of chop residue. Probably not the best thing to do. Likewise, we can see here, you can see the seed has been placed next to a piece of straw that's been pushed into the ground by the disc. And you think, well, that's okay. The soil is, there's enough soil there for the seed. But what in actual fact it does do, if you're not uh, aware of this, it can cause poor root development, which means it's got low uh, drought um, tolerance. Uh, low crop vigour, you can see that the crops not come through the ground quite as vigorous as you'd like because the residue can take up a lot of the nutrition. And the big one really for me is poor tillering or poor tiller survival. 
you can have a nice lot of tillers in the autumn. Come the spring when everything starts to grow, you suddenly find that half your tillers have gone and it's really gone because there's not enough rooting behind below those uh, crops to support the support the tillering. And also, when it happens a lot, lot later, but it comes from distilling into a lot of cereal residue, is you can get small ear size, mainly because the residue possibly could tie up the phosphate in that situation, which is one of the indicators for small ear size. Another picture here, this is taken from uh, Professor Trubugger in, in Germany, looking really at what residue can do to rooting. As you can see on, on the left there, that's a residue in a plow situation. This is in a no-till situation. And what I want to draw your attention to is the roots are at the very bottom. Residue is anti-rooting. We don't want to be doing that because obviously that will affect your moisture uh, uh, availability or drought tolerance or both. So we want to keep the residue on the surface and we don't want to be putting our crops or roots through it. Smearing the slot. Uh, if the conditions aren't quite right, dish drills can, can smear the soil. So there's a couple of pictures here where we have the crop has been slotted into the ground where the conditions are not quite right. And it's something that we need to accept with dish drills is they do not make tilth. At the very best, they will maintain the tilth that you've got, but if the tilth there isn't good enough, disc drills aren't going to improve it. Because of the action of a disc, it's a disc working on an angle, pressure on the soil, smearing action on the soil, they have the potential to ruin your tilth. They will not improve it for you. So, uh, higher maintenance, yes, I think that's a given. There's a lot of discs, uh, a lot of uh, bearings on discs, a lot of grease nipples, etc., etc. And they do allegedly handle stones a lot better, but I think that's a subject for another day. If we look at time drills, uh, the main benefit of a time drill that I can see, apart from the obvious one, is high cereal trash. Okay, this is a sort of situation I'd encourage all of you to do and not sell your straw, because chopping straw is a very quick way of improving your soil structure, the soil microbiology and everything and everything that we talk about in this show uh, is, is improved if you can chop your straw and improve your soil organic matter. So looking at the comparison with a disc drill, uh, what tiny cultures do is tend to brush the residue away, allowing you to put seed to soil contact. Because whatever system of crop establishment you're using, it's seed to soil contact is what it's all about. As I said earlier, well sown, your crop's half grown, and that's really what I'm saying. So if you're chopping your straw, which is what the advice I would give to anybody, then possibly you need a time when you're drilling through that, particularly with um, cereals uh, in, in the rotation. Sort of thing I'm looking at uh, would be a knife opener tine, working through chopped straw. You can see on the front of the cord is there, it's brushing the straw away, it's not trying to go through the straw, it's allowing the straw to maintain its place on the surface, taking less energy to try and incorporate it. You don't need to incorporate it, it. you just let the worms do it, but we need to be able to drill underneath it. So we do move more soil with time drills, that is their major weakness. And uh, what I would suggest is that we don't want wide horizontal working drills, otherwise we can stimulate weed germination for anybody who knows anybody who grows black grass, that's what can happen if you overstimulate the surface of the soil with a wide coulter. That picture was put on the internet, so it's not, I don't know where that is from or what it was drilled with, but I thought it must have been drilled with a wider coulter drill because there was only a small amount of black grass between those two rows. Sort of thing I'd be looking at would be using these uh, narrow knife openers. This is on an old horse CO drill that reduces the soil movement, gets the placement uh, in through the straw, uh, what I've been talking about earlier, so it does the job nicely there. Those are Metcalf points, I believe. Then we've got some Dutch Industries points here. I don't really care what they are, as long as they're nice and narrow and time-based so that you can get into and through the straw. Level fields, yes, time drills require level fields, as we mentioned earlier, uh, but I think that's part of your strategic levelling that you would do to start this system off because whether you're doing any cultivating or certainly harvesting level fields enable you to bring some accuracy back or into 
the system. Large cover crops, yes, I think in the early days you're probably not going to start with large cover crops and those of you in the north of England or Scotland aren't probably going to grow large biomass cover crops anyway. But um, the sort of thing that I like to see in early doors, these are rape volunteers after an Aussie rape crop uh, just been drilled with winter wheat. And uh, so that, that, that's a good enough cover crop for me. It doesn't have to be massive or we don't have to wait for it to get massive because some parts of the country we're not going to get that. Uh, and, and there's a resulting wheat crop coming up through those cover crop of the volunteers, just to show that it can be done. Uh, it's not a, a complete no-no. So, um, what's my next one? Gouging of the soil. Yes, if the conditions aren't right, time drills can be like disc drills, smear and slot. Time drills can gouge the soil and, and cause a poor um, seed bed. Um, and then the other one I like here is, you can make your own. It gets a lot of farmers into the system for not a lot of capital cost. One of the biggest um, objections I get is to say, well, it's cost too much money to get into this system, Steve. Well, there's an awful lot of farmers, some here, that have been using second-hand drills, retrofitted with narrow knife opener tines, are getting into the system and working very well with it. Uh, the other thing is, you can make your own if you're so, uh, so inclined. Uh, to get you even into a lower cost situation. Just give you a little um, rogues gallery. This one working quite nicely in Aberdeenshire. Got him started. This one in Leicestershire. That's direct drilling wheat into a facilia set aside situation. Uh, that is the late Jim Bullock's bean drill. Any of you who were lucky enough to know Jim, that's what he put together to get his beans in the ground. And then Something we've been working with as a company in the last couple of years is evaluating a disc drill that's second-hand, low cost. This Vada Stud Rapide, I mean, machinery dealer yards are full of them, and they're very good, cost-effective drills to have, because as I said at the beginning, you probably want to end up with one of each type. You don't have to spend a lot of money doing it. Certainly seen enough now, hectares drilled with one of these to say that it is a good enough direct drill. In actual fact, if you talk to Vardastad, the uh, rapid drill came off the drawing board as a no-till drill. It's just that no-till didn't really take off in, in Sweden for them. So they managed, um, sort of changed it, developed it to replace cultivations as the type you see. But there's a crop of wheat after beans drilled with it this year. A very tolerable job, I would suggest, for not a lot of money. Uh, I, I don't tell you what that drill costs because it, it, it's uh, very, very cost effective. So the main part though, with, with all of this, that with this drill is, is tilth creation. Tilth has the whole thing. Tilth is, to me, the most important thing. And you can see through some of these wheelings where this is with a, a John Dale zero till drill. That's placed the seed in lovely through those wheelings, obviously they were a bit dry when, uh, when it was drilled and not when this photograph was taken. My most extreme one, again, with a John Dale drill, or rather a zero till, uh, a seed hawk type time, going straight through a wheeling in this stubble. Obviously it's a lot wetter than when it was drilled, but the coulter enabled enough tilth to be made around the seed for effective establishment. If the rest of the soil profile underneath that is good enough, well structured, it's just been compressed on the surface by the combine tires, then you can do that with a disc drill. You're not gonna do that, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, with a disc drill. It may then force you to cultivate, which we wanna try and avoid. So, another situation, this is in the Vale of Evesham on some heavy Evesham series soil. I hope you can see the tire marks that are going across the drills there. That's where a black grass trial was, was held. You can see where the little combine had put some ruts in the ground. But the farmer here direct drilled again through with a knife opener drill, re-establishing the tilth where those wheels have been, enabling enough tilth to establish the crop. So just to sum up, to me there's three things that we've got to get right in crop establishment, whatever system we're in, but more appropriately in no tillage particularly. And number one is the tilth, number two is the tilth, and guess what number three is? Tilth is forgotten, I think, in this country at the moment. Drilling is going to a little bit of a mechanical operation. Can I put the seed in the ground? Yes, I can, and that'll do. Well, you have to have adequate tilth. So for me, if you're starting out or you're having any problems with your crop establishment, 
probably you want to look at getting a time drill with knife based openers, the narrower the better, and then complement it with a disc drill as you go into the future. But that's uh, my quick summing up of which drill you should have. And so, um, just to say, plan your adoption. Uh, don't do all the whole farm in one go if you can possibly help it because you're exposing yourself to the weather risk. Make sure you keep your nutrition up, particularly nitrogen, particularly phosphate. And I know that's challenging because you're not supposed to put uh, nitrogen on in the autumn, but I think if you're a fax qualified advisor and you know why you're doing it, then that's permitted. Uh, but it's very important. Uh, it was sadly missing a lot last autumn in, in retrospect. Uh, when we've looked at a few few crops this year. And then I've done my best to grapple with the thorny uh, subject of drill selection, but I do think uh, tilth has it. Uh, tilth is everything in crop establishment, whether it's no-till, min-till or conventional. So pick the drill that gives you the most tilth with the least amount of soil movement. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, I'd only be too pleased to have a go at answering them. Very interesting. I'm trying, oh. I'm trying for the mute button. Sorry, yeah. David. <laughs> no, I'm not going to ask anything difficult. The, um, your slide with the C drilled with the disc drill germinating and the issue with the roots. Yep. You talk about small heads and that sort of thing. Can some of those issues be overcome within furrow nutrition at the time of drilling? Um, they can, yes. Uh, and thank you for the question, David. But, um, they can be. It's just knowing how much are they affected. So you're in a little bit of unknown. Most of the problems are caused by the biology. You're improving your biology all the time, one hopes, taking the nutrition. So that's the first thing. So that can rob the nutrition that's right next to the seed. And then most of the other problems are the acids that are excreted by the bio biology, which can then have an effect on the rooting and the development of the crop. So which nutrient do you use? Can you put lime, nitrogen, and phosphate down the spout? You know, it then becomes a practicality. To me, don't do it. And it's really growing second cereals is the issue into chopped straw. Uh, other crops, wheat after rape, wheat, wheat after beans is not so affected, but they are affected. And it's only you can judge on your soil type how much the effect is from that. And it's a lot of the time an effect that nobody really pays any attention to in my experience. Hi Steve, um, Hi you said that uh, when starting you would go say wheat first for your first direct drill crop, why wouldn't you go grape crops such as beans? Um, really because winter wheat is the, probably the finest and most aggressive crop we grow. Um, we can adjust the seed rates a lot easier than say starting with a bean crop or a, a rape crop. No reason why you can't, it's just the plan that we've run for a few years now and it seems to work pretty well. Those of you who are suffering grass weeds, generally a break crop, we've, we've grown the break crop to reduce our grass weed pressure, so it means we can get the wheat away in a less pressurised grass weed situation. So it kind of fits better than most, but there's no reason why you can't start. Uh, with a with a break crop. I mean, you might start with levelling your fields, establishing your oil seed rate, for instance, or maybe even your winter beans, or prior to a cover crop, prior to spring beans, for instance, or peas. Um, but it's just to give you something to to, to think about, work on, uh, uh, but mainly grass weeds is the, probably the reason why we start with uh, winter wheat, plus the fact it's a very aggressive crop uh, on the soil and, and its development. Yeah. You, know, um, you showed the picture of the horse in the number of uh, times. What's the uh, maximum width do you reckon we can go with a drill uh, before you start affecting yield? Um, it's a question asked a lot. You know, what is the effect of row width? I think all the trials that I've seen 
uh, with uh, that configuration will give a 10 inch wide row or 25 centimeters. I, I've seen it's not affected the crop, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Though if things do go wrong with the crop, then it will affect them more, okay? But as you go really from here north, you know, the angle of the sun is not really gonna look at an, a, a, a wider row detrimentally. And what you tend to find is the agronomy of the crop changes, i.e. the bottom uh, leaves tend to produce more or catch more sunshine than if it's on conventional row spacing, okay? Two questions there. I mean, when um, you let uh, metal bashers loose, they do try and change things, don't they, to make it different? Yes, I can understand there's an agronomic reason for putting a disc in front of the tine because it makes a tine act more like a disc. However, there's something else that needs to be thought about, adjusted, worked, because what we don't want to do is cause ourselves an own goal. So, Yep, you can put a disc on the front of a tine, that does help you go through cover crops better, but I would ask yourself before you do that, do you, uh, are you going to be growing such big cover crops? Um, is, it, is it required? Uh, and is that disc going to get in the way? Is it going to wear before the tines do and therefore you're stopping drilling or something causes it to block better? Because the distance between a disc and a tine is critical, depending on what angle the tine's at and what you know, type of drill you've got. So you can just add to the problems you get with the drill, though I don't want to overstate that, as long as it's well maintained, and of course all of you with disc drills currently change your discs every year, don't you? Of course you do. So when you keep things fresh, they work better. If you add a disc to a time, that just adds potentially for more complication. To answer your question about the DAP, are you looking to put it down the spout or broadcast? If you're putting it down the spout, then uh, yeah, your, your price is going to go up. But really, if you're putting DAP fertilizer down the spout, you probably only need 25% of the rate that you would broadcast. So okay, you know, your price is going up, but uh, uh, what is it, a 50% increase on 25%, it's, it, suck it up. <laughs> D DAP is a very, very good fertilizer, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's, it's not really given the, the credit that it should be given. There is a difference between phosphate fertilizers and DAP it is very, very good. If you can't get MAP, but I think the trade now decided to keep that to themselves. Hi, we got a uh, um, disc drill. And if you're drilling winter wheat up a into say spring barley stubble, how do you mitigate the problems in the two with the seed sitting too close to a compressed uh, straw? How do you? It's, yeah, how do you mitigate it? It's um, putting a fertilizer, I would suggest, um, and try and sp spread your straw if you're chopping it as well as you can. Uh, but basically, sometimes you're, you're probably not going to be able to. Uh, Is it good to leave the straw long? I would leave it a little bit longer but I'd only do that once you're in the system a couple of years, because otherwise it will just hang around longer. You notice straw really only rots between the nodes. So if we're cutting our stubble, we should try and cut as many of the nodes off as possible and then chop it up. However, as you get more and more into the system and as your biological activity builds up and digests the straw faster and faster, you can start taking a few more liberties with longer straw. But longer straw doesn't necessarily overcome the hairpinning problem. It can help, but not completely. But that's one of the ways that you can do it, um, is, is probably remove the straw and then go down the rows with your drill so that you're not in the actual stubble. Okay, thanks. Uh, one more quick question. These uh, low disturbance subsoilers, in, in your experience, uh, are these effective in an hill system? Um, a low disturbance subsoiler uh, is an oxymoron. 
I mean, we really need to have a debate about subsoiling uh, in any, you know, micro subsoiling, mini subsoiling, low disturbance, no such thing. If you're subsoiling and require, you need to disturb the soil. So what are you doing? Are you going to do it properly or not? So do you need it is a big question. And a lot of the time, in my humble opinion, too much subsoiling is done in this country by habit or the calendar. Uh, there's a group of farmers that like subsoiling after the raw seed rape crop. There's a group of farmers who like to do it before the raw seed break. I'd love to get them together and have a little chat and decide how they go through their decision-making process. But most of the time, in my opinion, nobody takes a, a, a spade out, nobody investigates the soil, because a lot of the time, the crop that's showing compaction damage is actually put the compaction right during the year of lower yielding because of the compaction. Does anybody check that? A lot of the time, the answer to that is no. And therefore, then subsoiling comes along and undoes what the plant has tried to do in putting the soil right for you. Um, so, I quite happily call most subsoiling recreational tillage. Time's up. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.